All right. So welcome to today's SharePoint Shop Talk, a conversation with SharePoint professionals. It is the last Shop Talk of the month, so it's a very special um, occasion. It's when we have our panelists spotlight tips and tricks. My name is Jamie Wright. I am the SharePoint Shop Talk Community Manager and your moderator for today. If you have any questions about SharePoint Shop Talk, you can always uh, reach me um, by tweeting to me at SP Shop Talk or at our Corvus New York City, who is our, our uh, organizer. You can also find us on LinkedIn, SharePoint Shop Talk is our group name, and like us on Facebook, facebook.com backslash SharePoint Shop Talk. I'm just going to mute everybody's phone and um, I'll let you know how to unmute just because there's some static there. Okay, so in order for you um, to have the best shop talk, we ask that you please do not place the call on hold. You can always hang up and call back. If you're on the phone, you can unmute yourself and unmute yourself just by pressing star six. And if you are on the phone and you have not received an audio pen, please ping me by raising your hand and I'll send you one. And then you'll be able to speak and unmute and unmute yourself as well. When we go live for questions, all you have to do is state your name and your question, and please remember that no question is too small or too big. So, without further ado, we are going to start by talking to our panelists and introducing them. So, remember panelists, you can just go there and I'll, as a matter of fact, I'm going to unmute all my panelists so that you don't have to do it. And let's start with Chris Poteet. Hi, can you hear me, Jimmy? Jimmy? Yes, I can. Okay, I'm going to try and talk to the computer, see how that goes. Um, Sounds good. My name is, my name is Chris Oti. I'm a consultant with Port of Solutions on the East Coast. Um, I uh, do UX work and analysis as well, and um, you can find me on my various blogs there. All right, thank you so much for joining us, Chris. And next up is Laura Rogers. Laura Rogers, please introduce yourself to the group. Hi, I'm Laura Rogers, I'm SharePoint MVP. I work at a company called SharePoint 911, where I'm a consultant. And I've uh, written a couple of SharePoint books. They're listed on the screen. And uh, the InfoPath one is actually going to be out at the end of October. I'm very excited about that because I just finished turning the last review in. It's so nice to have free time now. Anyway, <laughs> um, my uh, my favorite things are InfoPath forms, DB web parts, and workflows, and I like to do what you can with SharePoint out of the box, all the out of the box functionalities. That's it. Thanks, Laura, and congratulations on finishing um, the book. Oh, Can't wait to do <laughs> Such relief. All right. And next up, we have Carlos Fernandez, partner in crime with Crystal T. Carlos, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Carlos Fernandez. I work with Chris Petit um, at Porter Solutions, and I'm a developer who um, also works on the UX UI side of SharePoint branding and SharePoint customizations. Welcome, welcome, Carlos. Good to have you back. And we also have John White on the phone, Microsoft MVP. Please, John, tell us a little bit about you. Hi, uh, it's uh, John White, as you mentioned. I'm a SharePoint MVP uh, with a company called Unlimited Viz in Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. Uh, I'm kind of an, I guess, probably best described as a, as a SharePoint architect, and uh, we focus in on SharePoint solutions that incorporate BI, business intelligence. Thank you, John. And John, I'm going to keep you on the spotlight just for two seconds because he has agreed to do our next panel of spotlight. Uh, taking place at the end of October, I believe it's October 27th. So, uh, sure, just tell us a little bit about what you'll be presenting. Uh, basically, it's uh, it's a solution to get uh, data out of SharePoint and into SQL, where you can do some more interesting things on it using the in-the-box SQL tools. We are looking forward to that, and uh, on our next email that goes out to all of our attendees and everyone interested in the SharePoint Shop Talk, you'll have your uh, registration link so that you can register for John's presentation. And last but certainly not least, we have the man of the hour, um, Ed Musters. Please introduce yourself, Ed. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, 
Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I was good. I was going to do that as part of the presentation, but uh, yeah, I'm at I'm at uh, Musters. I'm in uh, Toronto, Canada, SharePoint MVP, and uh, work as an architect and developer. So when Laura's done with all the out of the box stuff, I take over in the Visual Studio and take it further. All right. We're looking forward to your presentation and and why most of you are here. How to test SharePoint 2010 applications. So we'll get back to Ed very shortly. Just wanted to let you know who organizes uh, Shop Talk, and that's our COVID, a SharePoint Microsoft Gold Certified Partner. I'm sorry, a Microsoft Gold Certified Partner specializing in SharePoint and Enterprise Search, as well as business intelligence. And if you have any questions or input on Shop Talk or questions about SharePoint and Search, you can always email our COVID at info.covis.com and tweet to us at COVID New York City. So, before we get into Ed's presentation, we have a very special week coming up. Um, next week, we will not have Shop Talk because of a SharePoint conference. Most of our panelists will be there. And um, they've agreed to become reporters. Uh, there's going to be a lot, 240 sessions there and a lot of updates. So um, we just want to let you know that next week we will not have Shop Talk, but our panelists will be out at the conference. Wanted to hear if you, what are you guys looking forward to in regards to the conference next week? I know Laura's looking forward to something. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I was baffled by a JavaScript problem right now. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Don't mind me, I'm trying to do code. <laughs> um, I am looking forward to, and I actually just posted uh, yesterday all my book signings at the conference. So um, it's going to be three different book signings for um, my beginning SharePoint 2010 book for Rocks, and then one for the new InfoPath book. And since the book's not actually out yet, we're, um, we're, they printed out like book covers, and which is also like a coupon for a free ebook, and so we're going to be signing those. Nice. So um, I don't know if you want to just, put, you know, I think you already put my blog link up on the screen, but that's where I just posted all that, that whole list. And I'm very excited about it. And I'll be at the SharePoint 911 booth if y'all want to come say hi. Nice. All right, well, we won't take much time. I mean, if there's anything else to add about SharePoint Conference, we will take it up next week. And because um, we want to get to Ed's presentation. But before we do, we wanted to take at least one live question over the phone before we get to the presentation. Um, that's what we're here for. So I believe that if, if you have a question, you can state your name and your question. We'll take one. Nothing there. All right, then I'm going to hand it over to Ed, and um, just get bear with me while I make him presenter, and uh, we'll get started. All right, I'll make sure you can hear me and see my screen. Yes, everything's good. Uh, Jamie's? Yes, everything's good. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> I, I was a little bit worried by the deafening silence. <laughs> okay. um, so this uh, this presentation is a massively condensed, uh, very quick, high-level walkthrough on testing sh uh, issues um, uh, pertaining to testing, SharePoint 2010. This is a condensed version of, of a session I gave recently at the SharePoint Saturday New York City. Uh, so join along with me here. There's something here for everyone, regardless of your role. It's not just developer, but uh, uh, tester, BA, uh, operations, stress testing, whatever type of testing you need to do with SharePoint. We'll cover it at a high level here and hopefully leave enough time also for your questions. So first of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Shop Talk, Arcovis, and Jamie's for uh, having me here today, and happy to be with you. So I'll do some quick introductions. Why is SharePoint in particular difficult to test versus, say, any other custom-developed web application like MVC or something? We'll look at the types of testing that we can do. It's not just code testing or unit testing. There's lots we can do. 
Uh, unit testing is a particular concern in SharePoint, and we'll look at uh, a mocking tool that addresses this, not one that makes fun of SharePoint, but one that helps us uh, unit test SharePoint. And then we'll get into scenario testing with recorded web tests, and also stress testing with Visual Studio Ultimate, and then we can get into some Q&A. So first off, uh, we're, we're in Fusion. We're kind of all over the place. Uh, and I'm working out of the Toronto office. Uh, but me, I'm a SharePoint MVP. I just finished my chapter on uh, Expert 2010 Practices coming out from A-Press, and uh, also working on another book too. Uh, I've, I'm not finished the editing mode, but I'm getting into that. I'm also known as the .NET Ninja. Uh, that is me at the DevReach conference last year in my Ninja outfit. Uh, I will be speaking there again this year, so if you happen to be in uh, Southern Europe uh, at the end of October, uh, please join me. And yes, I do have a black belt, but uh, uh, you know, if you want to moderate your questions more carefully, you know, that sort of thing, just let me know. Okay, so I want to focus on a real-world case study. It's the City of Lethbridge. That's the most recent public website I was involved with uh, putting up. I was responsible for the testing of that, including the scenario testing to ensure, of course, that all the website functionality operated as we expected. We also had to stress test the solution in order to ensure the infrastructure met the non-functional requirements. And then according to their experience with their web analytics from their, their previous site, they wanted to know how would the website perform given uh, uh, the set of web analytics and usage that they expected. And then, and then they wanted to know, well, what's the peak load so that we kind of can judge the capacity and we know uh, what our server can take and when we may need to increase that. Where's Lethbridge? Uh, well, if you look at a map of Canada here, it is just south of Calgary in Alberta, so just, just towards the border there. So uh, you can go to lethbridge.ca if you wish. If you want to head off in your browser, it's uh, lethbridge.ca. Uh, this is um, a sample uh, screenshot I have uh, up from a site at a point in time back in July. But it's a typical, what I'll, what I'll say, it's a typical government website, a city website. So they're most concerned with the city's services that they can provide from three perspectives, being a resident, being a business in the city, or being a tourist, or perhaps looking at the city for potentially doing business with the city, or um, potentially visiting the, the city as a tourist as well. And again, importantly, what, what type of services the city government offers, and what are the contacts, and things like that. There are uh, other typical features that you might find in many public websites. There's a news center. There's a calendar of events. You, there are career opportunities, for example. So just you know some web content around the career opportunities at the City of Lethbridge. Many online services provided through the website. You can pay your utilities online, get your dog license <laughs> renewed, apply for your uh, business uh, through the website. And that being a SharePoint site, so why is it so difficult to test? given that it's a custom web application that, that we built. Well, first off, SharePoint is a product, and you don't have control of the implementation. So generally, given it's a web-based product, you can only test from the user interface perspective. There's a lot of configuration. Uh, for example, Laura does a lot of work in browser and with SharePoint Designer, and it's not really code, right? So, you know, how do you test those sorts of things? Even with Visual Studio customizations, typically, to really do unit testing, you'd have to code in patterns that facilitate unit testing. So, of course, if you're doing an MVC app, Model View Controller application, ASP.NET MVC, no problem. The unit testing is built in. You can just, in fact, it, the project generates with a unit testing solution. And because of the, the, the MVC patterning, um, unit testing is very easy to do. So uh, again, unless the developer is very disciplined in coding in something like Model View Presenter, it's going to be tough to test the code. Um, but also, your testers 
strangely enough, might not even have SharePoint installed to run unit tests again, so what can you do? Uh, what happens when the test involves uh, the SharePoint sites or lists uh, because you're, you're going to test against certain data? Um, how do you control that? So types of testing that we'll cover today are, so, so these are the categories of testing. So there's lots of categories of testing. So coverage testing is, is usually the, t the testing that's done during the development phase. And types you might think of are unit testing, check-in tests, build verification, functional tests, uh, and regression testing, just as examples. Then as you finish the development phase and you move on to stabilization, you get into more of usage testing um, to, dur during the testing phase. So that's where you test user scenarios. You test performance. You do stress testing. Configuration testing uh, might involve you know, different types of browsers. Uh, you know, does it work in this version of Firefox, that version of Chrome? Um, and, and compatibility testing as well with, with maybe different backend systems or integration points. So one way we can do unit testing uh, is by using a, a professional tool, a mocking tool. You'll, be, you'll need to uh, acquire one of these. Um, and so how we, the developers, generally do testing is we, we'll, we'll do like mocks and stubs, right? So for example, if uh, I just did one recently and it had nothing to do with SharePoint, the, the, the customer had a back-end DB2 database that we needed to return um, uh, specific information for regarding um, uh, vehicles, literally uh, motorcycles in this case. Um, so we, we had to retrieve vehicle information off their DB2 database. Well, I don't have a DB2 database handy, so I, I wrote a, a, a stub, actually a repository pattern that would allow me to switch it out to a little local SQL Server database I have that kind of has the same schema, so I can kind of plug that in and get data returned. So, um, so stubs are generally set in place to return the expected results, so typically data in that case, right? So I'm going to get back a set of vehicles. So mocks, on the other hand, involve testing the behavior of the code, the different code paths, where um, in this case, we don't actually care about the objects being real. So uh, let me put this in context. If I have an algorithm that calculates payroll, I'm interested in testing the algorithm. I don't really care, you know, I may have certain data where I want to test, you know, have test cases about full versus part-time employees, but um, I don't care about the SharePoint site part of it, or I don't care about um, uh, having a real list on hand or real data. I, I just want to test the code pass. Uh, it, it's good, but it, it's generally doing mocks and stubs are generally only possible when you have, uh, you've written the code and you're in full control. So, so again, SharePoint being a product, uh, you don't have, say, such good control over the SharePoint object model. So coding against that is notoriously difficult to actually unit test. The SharePoint object model has internal constructors, sealed classes, no interfaces. So it's... It, it's notoriously there to, to, to try and get a hold of the SharePoint object model and do something with it. So TypeMock Isolator is a commercial product that you would purchase. And you will need such a mocking tool in order to do unit testing. Telerik also has one called JustMock, but you know, it doesn't matter. Pick your tool. Uh, we can do the same types of things with it. So what this does is it gives you the ability to fake out SharePoint objects. So quite literally, you can create, you, you don't, again, you, you'll see a scenario where I don't care what the website is, or even if I have a SharePoint list, I just want to fake it out and run some code. And since I can create fake SharePoint anything, uh, a site collection sites, um, uh, lists, so SP site, SP web, and SP list are typically things we want to fake out, you can run unit tests, you don't even need SharePoint. So this is good, by the way, for those testers who have to run particular test cases, and their job is to test the payroll calculation. Again, they don't care about the SharePoint aspects. So let me do, uh, uh, it's, it's a really quick demonstration, like I could spend all day on this. Um, 
So I'll just wait a second. I know it might take a second to refresh. But what we have here is just some random SharePoint code. But what I want you to note is that you can see that the code itself says for each SP list in the web. So for every SharePoint list in the web, it's going through and doing some stuff. So I've also got a routine here which will then, for a, a given task list, it will um, go through the lists and return to me the tasks that are marked urgent. So here it's going after SP list items. So you can see it's heavily using the SharePoint object model. And to test the code that, um, you know, is the code properly looking at uh, urgent tasks and returning them, you could think to test this that, okay, what do I need to do? I need to set up a site, a site collection or a site. I need to have a tasks list with, I'll presumably, uh, I'll, I'll pretend it's the out-of-the-box schema here, which it is. Um, I need to populate it with the, the actual list with data. I need to put in uh, task items in there, some of which are urgent and some of which are not. I need to come up with particular test cases to implement and then run this code against that SharePoint site, that SharePoint list, just so I can see if I get urgent tasks back or not. So uh, I think this is the one here, yes. So this is the unit test project. So this is literally just a unit test. This is a test method. And I want to test that routine which gets the urgent tasks for me. So I'll just take off the breakpoint for a sec so it might be easier to read. Uh, uh, Jamie's, I just want to make sure that uh, you were concerned. Um, is, is the clarity of the screen fine? Uh, it's blurry or? It's clear, yes. OK, awesome. OK, good. Um, uh, so. What we're doing here is with type mock isolator, so it's this namespace called isolate, you, you, you literally create a fake instance of a site collection because I literally, it's a fake, it just comes back, it looks to the code like it's a SharePoint site collection, but it's not a real one. It's a fake one. It looks exactly like an SP site to the code, but um, uh, you, you'll notice it's not firing up a SharePoint site or a URL. You can keep going. So for example, after I got a fake site collection within there, I can create, uh, um, so what are we, we, we creating here? You can create a fake task list and look at this, keep going. You know, again, I'm not going to go through this in, in a bunch of detail, but uh, take it for granted that what we're doing here is cre actually creating, we created a fake task list and we're creating fake task list items, but they are real from the perspective of the code. When the code goes to go through for each SP list item in the task list, it, to the code it will look like real tasks as if they had come from a SharePoint site. So they're fake, but they're real. Right? Kind of counterintuitive, but that's the way it is. And then once I've set up all the fake stuff because I don't have a real SharePoint site or I don't even care or want to take the time to set up a real SharePoint site to write the code against, I can uh, take a sample set of tasks, run my test to make sure that the two urgent tasks were to do the laundry and wash the dishes, although I think the dog would take priority at some point if it's uh, sort of crossing its legs and whining at the door. But um, for sake of this example, the two important tasks are do the laundry and wash the dishes. We test that. And, and we're good. So, uh, you know, I mean, I'll walk through the code very quickly here uh, in terms of just, I mean, it doesn't do anything, unfortunately, but you, you will see that. Um, taking its time here. Oh, okay. I really did hit F5. So what I want to do is I'll also head into SharePoint Logic and uh, just stop at Get Urgent Tasks. So you'll see, oops, sec. Okay, so we're at a breakpoint here. 
So I'm going, just going to step through the code. So I create a fake SB site, create a fake task list, um, set the urgent, urgent uh, property, uh, set up some actual tasks, and set the uh, you know, get urgent tasks list, and then let's do some tests here. So you can see that um, the, the, the SharePoint code is firing. It's asking for a new SP site. And guess what? It gets one, even though for sure, I assure you, there is no SharePoint site on my machine called SharePoint.TypeMock.com. Uh, I could have put any URL in here at all. Um, I go to open the web and open the task list and it works. So what Isolator is doing is it's kind of this dependency injection. Every time uh, the code asks for something SharePoint, it gives it something it thinks is real. Okay, and then it actually got a list of tasks from from the the fake stuff. And so I'm I'm really and truly able to go through the list and look at the tasks that I had created in the previous code. Okay, so I think that is like super, super cool. Right, so, I, sorry, I didn't step through it, but um, uh, I assure you it came back and my asserts uh, worked. I got the right uh, task back. So that's just like super cool. Okay. So now I want to, so, you know, I'll just go away from a developer type of testing and look at scenario and stress testing. So we had all these website features to develop, news, calendar, job opportunities, those sorts of things. Um, there were scenarios to perform for the, from the point of view of the content author as well as from the point of view of the public coming in, searching for career opportunities, um, you know, applying for one of the positions. So you want to test many scenarios from the user's point of view, again, the user being the public or, or, or being the content author. What we did initially was when well, we said, well, what does the public want to do on the website? We went to web analytics. Um, so what we saw was that, I don't know, i um, just making this up, 10% uh, of the people when they come to the website, they go to the events calendar and they look for the upcoming events. 15% uh, of people, they come look at the recent news. 5% uh, of people come and look at the job opportunities in the city, et cetera, et cetera. So what you do is you kind of get a 100% mix of the um, ratio of typical scenarios that the public would perform when they come to the website. So that, that's very important in setting up the different scenario tests. Um, what we can do is, uh, whether you've used Visual Studio Ultimate or not, like uh, there's the Rational Suite of Tools, Rational Robot, and probably you guys can come up with 10 other web record and playback tools. So, so basically it'll follow along in the browser as you click through the browser, and it will record a script of that uh, travel, and then it will play it back. You know, then you can just hit a play button and it will play back the very same scenario. So again, you can do that using a number of tools. I will be using Visual Studio Ultimate Edition to do that. Okay, so to record a web test. So I do have my, do have my site here. So I have my City of Lethbridge site on my development machine. And, um, you know, I can, I can travel to, to different things. So, for example, I can have a, you know, I can head off to the job opportunities here. And we all love virtual machines, don't we, developers? Sorry, I'm just increasing the resolution so we can see this better. We have uh, job opportunities, we have upcoming events, and I put one in October. Uh, oh, sorry, I put one in October for DevReach. And in the news, I put in a SharePoint Shop Talk uh, news item. So, you know, I put in some test data here, and I can start recording some, some testing scenarios. 
So in a, in a test project, what I can do is I can use the, well, I can't see it because of my menu, but uh, I can create a new test. And it's called a web performance test, but to me that's a bit, little bit misleading because all it is is going to be a record and a playback scenario. So you can see the recorder come in up here. And so what I do is I travel to my website, like I'm a member of the public. Did I? No, oh, I can't type. You know what? I'm going to stop that just in case. Uh, you know, the web test would literally fail <laughs> at that point, right? <laughs> Silly me. Uh, cancel. Uh, I'm just going to delete that one. Sorry about that. I will learn to type next time. Okay, so new test, a performance test. I'll make sure I type it correct. Okay, so you can see in this the script here, it's actually following along here. You know, capturing everything that's going on here. It's kind of like um, uh, Fiddler. You know, it's kind of like a, a Fiddler proxy. Um, so, for example, I can um, uh, I can go to the job opportunities section, and you know I can look at a job. So that's one of the things that the public is is going to do. And then what I can do is simply stop that, and that script is now recorded as my web test. And what you can do, although you can play it back directly, but there's a lot you can do here in terms of it has generated a script. There's a lot of things you can do just with the scripting. Like, for example, um, if I had added a product to the shopping cart, then I would be able to create a script that would, um, you know, add different items to the shopping cart or, you know, uh, different quantities to the shopping cart, you know. So I can take one script and code up many scenarios out of it. <clears throat> I don't have to actually physically do every single action. So I'm going to record a one, uh, one more here. So test. You really want to get up my menu. Thank you. Uh, OK, so new test. Uh, web performance 2. Oh, I see. There's my bad typo. And I don't know, I'm going to do a different thing. I'm going to visit the news. And I'm going to look at the, <clears throat> this particular news item as, a, as, as my scenario number two. And I'll say that's the end of that scenario. It could obviously be a lot more elaborate than that. So that will help you verify the different scenarios that the um, uh, you know, for each requirement that you have captured, you can record these scenarios to prove that the requirements have been met. And as you make changes or updates to the features or the product, you can redeploy the changes and you can rerun these tests. Um, finally, one of my favorite things about Visual Studio Ultimate is when I do this new test here, like this is so cool. Um, what I'm going to do is a load test, but again, it's a little bit misnamed because it's it's not just for load tests. Welcome to the wizard. So I'll call it uh, whatever scenario one. First off, see that what this is going to do is run a set of tests, run a set of these uh, web tests that I've just recorded. And you can use recorded think times or you can use a normal distribution centered on think times or not at all. The first scenario says that, well, as I was actually recording the script and clicking through the website, you know, I stopped on each page for, I don't know, two, three seconds and continued on. So using the recorded think times would actually play it back at the same speed as a normal user would use the website. The do not use think times means almost like a robot hitting the site. It's going to just hammer the, hammer the script in as fast as it can execute it. So one is more, to me, used for a scenario test, and number two would be used for a stress test or load test to, to see how much capacity the server can handle. Then, 
you can have this machine, and if you can imagine me pointing at my laptop, this machine will generate a load of 25 users on the website. Uh, one little caution here, um, I can put in 10 million if I want, but I assure you this laptop does not have the resources or even network bandwidth to hit the server with real 10 million user load. Um, if you want to do a real, real load test, what you would need is a lab. Like, so usually we would take over a training lab with like 10 computers in it, and I can actually use my workstation as the controller and slave out 10 computers, almost like doing a t literally a denial of service attack on the server. I, t I slave out 10 computers and I have each one of them represent 25 users, for example, to represent 250 concurrent users on the server, and that's, that's literally a lot more realistic. So I'll just say 25 for now. Um, whatever, based on tests, not interested in that. But this is where it gets interesting. So what I can do is I can add in web test one, which was looking at the job opportunities. And, oh, sorry, I have to actually move them over. I want both my tests, uh, the one with the job opportunities and the one with the news. And I can say that um, people look at job opportunities 5% uh, uh, of the time and at, uh, you know, the news 95% of the time, of course I'd have more in here. So remember what I talked about before about having a, a, a realistic mix of scenarios based on web analytics? That's if you want a realistic um, uh, a performance test on your server or scenario test on your server. Okay, so make it real. Otherwise, I assure you the statistics you get out of this you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't do good planning on these web tests, these statistics are meaningless. You know, I can't really interpret them for you. Um, it's also interesting that uh, we can specify mixes of people coming in at different speeds. Like if you still have people coming in over dial-up on your website, you could, you know, maybe say 5% of users are dial-up. For sake of my example, I'm going to remove that, but, you know, I'm going to assume everybody's on a corporate intranet or something like that. You can also mix up, like, you know, not everyone uses that, so I can do some verification here that it'll work in Chrome or Firefox or different versions of IE or whatnot. So I, I can also mix up the browser mix. And as I mentioned, I can set up my test computers here and finish that. Uh, for sake of time, I'm not going to actually run the load test. I'm just going to show you... Uh, the, the output basically and show you what we discovered. <laughs> oh God, I felt stupid when we did this. So um, stress testing is observing the, the system under performance load. You want to put it under a typical load to validate your architecture. You want to put it under a peak load to validate capacity projections and then you actually want to put it under maximum load to understand where the bottleneck occurs and, and if that is sufficient um, uh, capacity uh, for you online if like everybody in the city hit the website at the same time or something. So um, another best practice, by the way, uh, we learned in, in one of our cities, we actually also did City of Calgary, it's a cool website if you want to go there. Um, uh, we were getting bad performance, but basically we started ripping out all the network pieces, like the, the whatever, the UAG, the firewall, the this, the that. We literally plugged our test lab directly into the server so that we, then, then it's discovered, oh, you know what, the, the servers are performing well. Uh, the bottleneck must be somewhere else. Um, maybe the load balancer was, was causing some problems. So you want to make sure that first you validate the servers before you back out and validate the network infrastructure. Um, obviously monitor from a separate computer, and please, it's, if you're going to compare, you need to establish a baseline. So again, the results are meaningless, unless you have something to compare them to. And please start your baseline with all performance optimizations off. For example, uh, the publishing infrastructure has built-in caching. Turn it off because you're not going to find your bottlenecks because everything gets cached and everything looks really good. Um, Increase the load in increments, like, you know, step it up and see how much pressure the thing can take before it breaks. Um, just common pitfalls. I've, I mentioned one about, you know, 
thinking your computer can do 50,000 concurrent users. It can't. Um, doing something once is great. Repeating it a million times successively is not helpful because you're probably just serving from cash. Great realistic scenarios. And know that you'll eventually run into a bottleneck, but the trick is uh, deciding when, when it's good enough. Um, when, you do, when you do apply performance optimizations like caching, apply them one at a time and retest against your baseline because you want to see what improvement that particular optimization makes. And I mentioned the other one about testing direct against the server so because otherwise you don't know if it's the firewall that's doing something bad for you. So with uh, Lethbridge, so let me get, let me finish with uh, discoveries from Lethbridge. Um, <laughs> this was bad. Um, we thought, okay, well, I'll start doing performance testing. We were just hitting the home page. It, it was horrible. It was like, I can't believe, <laughs> of course, we blame SharePoint. It's not me, right? Um, we thought, this is, this is horrific. This, is, uh, this isn't even performing as well as the old site. And the old site was like on Microsoft Content Management Server. So this was looking bad. So first off, we looked at the website stats. So this is kind of their stats. Yeah, it's a small city and stuff, but, you know, reasonable number of things. So we kind of knew what to expect initially, and we built our uh, tests off of this activities. Um, the, again, this is the website we were testing. Oh, and notice, uh, you know, for sake of time, the, the long story short is here, look at the weather widget. That was actually the culprit. Um, that that uh, is getting the weather from the Yahoo Weather Service, and yeah, guess what? The page performs well for one user, but when 10,000 were hitting this concurrently, everybody's going out to Yahoo RSS in real time to go get the updated weather. Well, the weather doesn't update every millisecond, so I guess, you know, small little duh, but, you know, head back to the weather web part, uh, throw in some caching so that we only grab the weather update once an hour problem was solved, right? So this was um, the performance before. The system under test here uh, is what the stats are. And as I said, we literally were just hitting the home page and things were horrifyingly bad, right? <laughs> we implement our optimizations, which were the caching. Uh, so uh, we, we enabled lots of things, site collection level, blob caching, uh, ASP.NET caching for the weather service, some other tweaks at the networking level. We did, we did a bunch of things. But then what we were able to do is the, yeah, the, see the server kind of uh, sort of headed up to about 40% and was kind of uh, leveled out there in terms of serving pages, even though the user load, you know, we, we kind of maxed out the user load to 100 users here and, and we were good. So, you know, we, we, we stepped it right up to the maximum and, and kind of things held there. So, you know, things were good. Um, so I'm going to leave some time for question and answer or I'll, you know, turn it back over to Jamie's to moderate the questions and uh, see where we take it from here. So you want to take back over, Jamie's? Sure. Um, I will take back over now and I see some questions coming in already, so this is good. Give me two seconds. You know, I'm going to leave you as the presenter just in case there's anything that, they, that might be on your screen that oh, might be... Sure. Okay. All right. So let's just see what we have here for questions. All right. It's coming up on your screen. First question. Can you see it there? Uh, I have to bring up the panel one sec here. It says the, uh, the mock-up looks cool. However, what techniques would you advise against testing any out-of-the-box and SharePoint designer customizations? I am thinking mainly user scenarios, which users can see what, in my case, are currently developing against a semi-live farm. Uh, yeah. And the, the uh, the 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 mocking stuff is cool, um, although it only applies to code, right? So I believe, unless uh, you know, I'll even throw it out to Lara if she's still around. Um, I think you're restricted to what you can do with like the recorded web tests type of thing. I, I think you'd have to verify your scenarios 
um, that way. And then the other question I, I, I don't have a good answer to either is um, how you might test SharePoint designer workflows. You know, again, I can think of testing the code ones, but not so much uh, the SharePoint designer. Yeah, in, uh, in SharePoint Designer 2010, you'd have to remember to make it a reusable workflow, and then you could move it from site to site, but that is even a tiny bit buggy when I've done that a couple of times. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that they may look pretty and cool, but when going from one server to a completely different server, it's there's still going to be a couple of different things you have to tweak to get it to work right. But um, So but to, only if you make you... it reusable can you do that. But that that's to deploy. But have you actually been involved with uh, like writing tests against um, SharePoint Designer stuff, like to verify scenarios requirements? Oh, I would just I, I would just try. To, that's the way I do it. Is I just try different or have the users try. You know, give them a list of you know, fill out a form, make someone go approve it, fill out a different form, make someone go reject it, fill out a, you know, and and this just it would just be a list of things that they would have to try. Yeah. So there would be either manual tests or, as I was uh, alluding to, you'd, you'd have to use the recorded web test um, to, you know, record the click-through so that you could replay That's it. Pretty That's cool. the only way I can think of testing it. So. All right. Well, thank you so much. I uh, hope that answers your question, Daniel. And there's also... Uh, yes? Sure, that's not what he wanted to hear. But anyway, so. <laughs> All right. I'm sending off another question. Uh, this one is coming from Carlos, one of our panelists. That's and not fair, is it? <laughs> it says, uh, Ed, what is a typical request per, sec per second that a server should adhere to when you are load testing the SharePoint solutions? Oh, boy. Yeah. No, there is no, um, unfortunately, there's no magic number. You can't say request per second equals uh, users. It's a bit of analysis. You have to use the, because it depends on, on the scenarios, the custom code, you know, if, if something is more transactional versus content serving. Um, the, the raw request per second or pages per section per second is not, there isn't a number you can multiply it against to get uh, the number of users. So what I'll typically do, uh, and I don't pretend to know, you know, uh, core infrastructure, uh, I'll usually work with one of our infrastructure folks, like I'll bring the results over and we'll work together with some of the network statistics and other things to try and, and uh, determine that answer. So it's a bit more of an art than a you know, a direct number saying multiply request by second by 52 and you get the number of users. So unfortunately it's, a, it's a, not a straightforward answer, unfortunately. All right. Uh we have a couple of questions coming in, so here's another one. Um, this one's in a chat window, and it says, well, what's your rule of thumb for the effective, wait a minute, okay, effective number of simulated users per workstation? Did I use that question? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> I, I got a Core i7 with uh, 10 gig of RAM. It, it, absolutely, it um, is a matter of, okay, so if I go back to... Uh, see the controllers and agents. This software also monitors the controllers and agents. So what I would really say is um, if you're getting towards the 80% level on your controller, you've maxed it, or your agent, any one agent, you are maxing it out. Um, it, the agents are the ones, sorry, the controller obviously because um, you want to make sure that it's coordinating the right amount of activity, but the agents are the important one. The agents are getting to like 80%. Um, that's the maximum for that computer. And the other thing to watch for, uh, so in addition to maxing out the one computer in terms of number of users, so obviously the more RAM, processor, uh, whatever other capacity you have, the bigger the laptop, the more users it can represent. Um, but please watch. I, I highly recommend you also have a, like a network sniffer in the network because you obviously once the network utilization gets above a saturation point, and I think that's around you know 80% or something, 
someone in the networking world can let me know, but there is a percentage point where the network becomes saturated and basically, you know, flooding it with more requests doesn't result in any more traffic hitting the server. All right. A couple of more questions coming your way. Um, one is uh, from Abheath, and I'm going to send that to you. It says, have you ever noticed uh, any issues using these two in the non-anonymous claims-based environment? In a claims-based environment, I actually haven't run it. Oh, I've run it in a like an intranet, but it happened to be like you know AD authentication. I actually haven't run it officially yet with a claims-based environment like an intranet. So I've done uh, AD authenticated intranet and anonymous websites. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not really, as long as the authentication works, I'm not expecting a problem. All right. And the next question would be coming from uh, Russell. How would you recommend testing the functionality of email alerts notifications that are triggered by workflows? Oh, I had that question myself, right, on, on how to test uh, workflows. Um, Testing in what way? Um, like, I mean, you're 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 going to, if you end up performing actions like I don't know, submitting your time report that results in a workflow that triggers an email. I would be expecting those those emails to trigger, um, but they are the more the result of uh, the timer jobs in SharePoint than than anything else, right? It's not something um, I even have. Uh, direct control over. So, is is there any clarification of what you mean by testing emails? I mean, I mean, I'm expecting them to fire as part of what I'm doing, right? Uh, Arasa, if you don't mind, you can definitely clarify. I'll unmute you now. Go on. Hello. <laughs> yes. I can hear you. Oh yeah. Um. If an email is triggered as a result of a workflow, I would expect that it had the proper links in the in the response. And if there's any functionality in this tooling that you were showing that would verify that the, the content of the of the email was correct. Uh, good question. No, I can't think of offhand. I mean these these particular tools are designed to test um, code or test, you know, following through a website. I can't, I can't see where I could uh, trap or inspect the email to make sure it had the right uh, information coming back. I imagine that would, honest to goodness, that would have to be a simple verification step by the tester to look through the emails and, and see if they contain the right information. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not certain if someone's talking to us over there, but uh, I'm going to move. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question sent in by Nelson. Uh, I don't seem to have those test widgets available in Visual Studio 2010. Do I need to install them from somewhere? Uh, you to to do what I'm doing here. Sorry, I should have. Uh, um, clarified that I am using Visual Studio Ultimate Edition. They are these testing tools are only available in the Ultimate Edition. Um, so what I recommend is even if you are a development team, um, I recommend that you, you know it's a it's it's a by the way Visual Studio Ultimate has a hundred and one other things in it like for the architect and the PM and the uh, team and all, all sorts of other things. Anyways, go on about that. But uh, I think it's a great investment for any team to at least get one <laughs> copy of Visual Studio Ultimate so that at least you have a bench so that you can uh, do these types of web tests. So that it's, they're just invaluable. But you need Ultimate. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to give uh, one more minute before we uh, move on to live questions over the floor, because I think we do have one out there. Um, are there any more questions for Ed? 
All right, thank you so much, Ed, for your presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. I, uh, we had some people say that they really enjoyed your sense of humor. They wanted the laugh button, and I could agree for that. <laughs> That's a new feature for the meeting software. Yes, I think La they... A laugh track. <laughs> well, and uh, we will have this uploaded onto our Facebook site and YouTube um, by the end of the week, actually. I, I think by tomorrow we, we're getting a lot better with it. So um, if there's any questions, you can always email me or, um, or Twitter to, tweet to us at SPShopTalk. And thank you so much, Ed. Okay, thanks, everyone. All right, so I have a... Bye. Bye. <laughs> Don't go anywhere, Laura. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, we still have three more minutes, and I believe there's a question online. Just make me present it real quick. Let's see here. Uh, let's see. I believe there's a question from Daniel. Daniel, and uh, I unmuted you, Daniel, so you can ask your question to the panelists. Hello? Hello. Hello. Um, having a question. Oh, the question was, I was using um, views with a, um, like a get list items. Yeah, and a couple of questions were there were, if I want to return all the items and then put, put an XSLT filter, is there, is, there, is there an advice on the number of items I return? If I stick with the common 30, I notice that, for example, half my contacts don't appear in my, um, in my data view web part, so I can't filter them based on their, say, association with a client. Um, and before, Daniel, you responded on my blog post, right, asking about this and emailed me? That's correct, yeah. Okay, good. And uh, I had Laura, she, she was kind enough to look and make a response. So uh, just so Laura, when I asked oh, her... Oh, yeah, like, that. I thought that sounded familiar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the trick to that question was that you wanted to go cross-site collection. That's correct, yeah. So that's not going to just be any normal... Data view web part. Well, well, apparently, I got another t email from Mr. Mark Anderson who reckons you can do it without using web services or SOAP or REST. Now, well, yeah, exactly. The, sort of yeah, the response that I said was the was via search. What did he say it was? Um, it, uh, 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 I can't remember. Can you really clarify that, please? I can't remember. Well. In, in my response, I was talking about basically using the search results web part, so it uh, has nothing to do with uh, web services or anything. I, um, I think I'm, I think we cross cross channels here. I, I was I, I I was talking to Chris regarding this question. I don't think I've ever. Okay, I, I Chris was just telling I, you that I made a comment on the blog post. That's all. Oh, I remember, I remember the question <laughs> I asked you. Yes, I remember now. I remember now. Isn't the business search okay. restricted to the? Um, to a site, to a scope, search scope, just for site collection, or can it do cross no. cross site collections? Yeah, that's the key. It can go cross farm, cross anything. Uh huh. Uh huh. So that's so that's one way of doing it then, rather than using the web services. Any, um, I think the disadvantage of the web services, you have to bring information back and then filter it, which to me this seems very, you know, it just seems not very efficient. Right. Right. Right, it'd be nice to have it filtered before you get to you, wouldn't, wouldn't it? Right, so you could create a custom search scope or, you know, use custom, um, what are those called, metadata in search. It's not called metadata. Help me out facet? here, y'all. What? You mean a facet? No, it starts with an M, and just in search administration where you can create, like, your managed... Uh, like, Property? Field. Yeah, managed properties. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll use those. Yeah, yeah. So you could use those, and you can use a custom scope to define that at the search level, and then when you create your web part, it's only going to show you the, that specific okay. set of information. Yeah, I think that I think that's a I think that's a technique I could use actually. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a lot better than creating data stores, and, and uh, it just seems so cumbersome. So it's mm -hmm. hard to manage as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much for your question, and, and Laura and Chris for our referring shop talk to answer it. And we just have one last question. We're over our time a little bit, but if you can ask this one question that John Clemens sent in. 
And um, Jamais, yes. Can I just add one little thing um, to that sure. recommendation? Um, you might, if there's a requirement on the data being like live or active, uh, keep in mind the search will only update on incremental when the next incremental update occurs. So you just have to communicate that to whoever you're implementing that for, so that they're aware of the delay until the incremental call happens again. Yeah, that's the biggest negative. And then the, and then the list, the okay. item l limit is also another negative. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll explore those. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Carlos. Um, any added um, viewpoints is always welcome. So, uh, John, are you on the call? Can you ask your question live? I'm unmuting you now there. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Okay, great. Thanks. Um, okay, thanks for staying over a little bit. Um, and sticking on the topic of search, the question is just around the organization of search results in MOS 2007 and the degree of difficulty in customization, if that's, an, if that's a requirement, in um, organizing those search results by either content type or, um, or by site or by some column value or search scope um, so that it's kind of presented in the same way that, that the, the group by feature in a, a view um, would group the, uh, the information. Yeah, this is Laura. I think the answer to that question is the same as the answer to the last question. As in uh, that blog post of mine that he's talking about, let me, um, the name of it is uh, what part sites I have access to. Um, but anyway, the, basically the gist of it is that you're using the search results, but you're customizing it like a data view web part. So it's, I believe that, you know, once you're at that piece of the, that part of the step where you're in the data view web part customizing it, group by would just be one of the functionalities you can add to it. Has anybody actually tried that with the search results? Okay, I'm let me find that link real quick. Okay. Okay, so you're saying through a customization of the data, data view web part, um, would you would you feed the results to that data view web part then? Yeah, the da the data view web part would would replace your search web part, your regular search results web part. Okay. But that's not something that I mean, you'd have to manually go put that on all of your search results pages if you wanted to replace that everywhere, or unless you just you know you just use one big search center then. Right. Uh, I guess I'm wondering, is there any way through, um, you know, XSLT customization or something that you could, um, you could do that uh, through just, you know, using the, the search results, um, you know, web partner engine that's there on the page already, um, and just kind of, you know, customizing. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what you're doing in this. You're just, you're just taking the search results web part that's there already, and you're just putting a different one, the exact same web part on there, the one that you've customized. Okay. So I put the link in the chat window, but of course I don't have any way to share it with you. Um, did you did? Uh, I posted this question on LinkedIn also, so if you want to um, you know, just add, add it as a comment to the question, that would work. And I also just shared the link there as well. Okay. Thank you. All right, yeah, try well, it out. I mean, obviously, you're going to have to be a little creative because the one in the example is to just look at sites. But once you get the idea, I think, of what you're trying to do, then I, I think that you'll be able to figure out how to tweak it to do what you want it to do. Okay, and would this hold? I see this is 2010. Would this hold for Moss 2007 as well? Yes, absolutely. And I also have links on there to several other people's blogs that have written about this same technique. Yeah, I, one of the other MVPs and I were joking about this the other day, saying I think that's one of those rites of passage because just about every MVP has written a blog post about <laughs> the search results web part doing this. So there are a lot. There's lots of stuff out there about it. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I think that's all the questions that we have for today, and, and it's definitely all the time that we have. So I want to thank all our attendees and our panelists, and special thanks to Ed for a great presentation. And remember, next week we will not have Shop Talk. We are um, closing it for SharePoint Conference. So we hope to see you all on the 13th, and thanks again. Bye. <laughs>
Jerry. Bye -bye. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.